grateful for them. And uh, we're so sure happy to see Sister Miss St. Virginia back. She's been traveling ever. She wanted me to feel sorry for her. She said, I've been to Mississippi, and then I've been to Colorado, and then I've been to Mississippi. And, and it was just so painful, and I feel so sorry for her. If she hated it so bad, next time you just pay for it, I'll go. And just, I want to know how bad it really is. I've been to Colorado and uh, been out west before, and I like it. Do you need some more? Here's the deal. Y'all don't have to come every Wednesday. Because last week I made too many. Raise your hand until you get one. One, two, three, four. He'll make them. He'll make them. Can't live or lose it. Last week I made way too many, had a whole stack to throw away. And then this week, I maybe just need to tell you, my wife start emailing them out to everybody. And if you want one, you got it. Because the handout's important. It's very, very important. And uh, that's your notes, that's your reminder. And we want to make sure uh, we just steadily grow. Well, nobody feel bad that we didn't have enough. It makes me happy. And I just keep making less and less copies till we have too few. So they got to go make some more. Then I feel like we've got a house full. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. We have, I'm very happy to tell you we've had one Wednesday night in 2024, one Wednesday night where we had less than 100 people. We've had 100 or more every Wednesday night of this year. It is. It is. And you ought to see when I tell my buddies about that, uh, uh, they they don't think I'm telling the truth all the time. Because many, many churches don't have but about a third of their regular attendance on Wednesday nights. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you come on Wednesday nights. A um, little bit of a history lesson tonight, and I know some of you don't care anything about history. I, for one, love history. I absolutely love history, and I like to, my family gets aggravated at me when we go to a museum or something, because, I, Brother David, I go to state. I read every little placard. I look at every little display. I, I like history. So tonight's a little bit of a history lesson to begin with, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. 1517, over 500 years ago, a German priest named Martin Luther. Anybody heard of Martin Luther? He launched what has since then come to be known as the Protestant Reformation. When he published some writings that he called the 95 Theses, and uh, it's not immensely clear whether he did, in fact, post them on the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany, but they were published, and it is possible that he went around and put them on the door of several churches. Now, uh, ironically enough, since we're teaching a series on doctrine, Luther was frustrated with the process which was commonly practiced at that time in the Roman Catholic Church, which Luther was a priest, a part of, this pro process, this problem, or this process, was the selling of plenary indulgences. Now, practically speaking, an indulgence, or plenary indulgence, was an offering that you could give to the church in which prayers would be prayed, and your loved ones that were gone on would only spend a short time in purgatory because of this indulgence that you bought. Um, in effect, the, the, the doctrine was that these indulgences would remit sin. So if you gave a good enough offering, then your loved one could stay in purgatory for just a little while. And purgatory was kind of like junior hell. And 
you would be there for a while and it would be really bad, but it would be so bad that it would purify all the bad out of you. And then you could go to heaven. Now, the Bible very clearly declares that baptism in Jesus' name alone is for the remitting of our sins. You can't pay to get your sins forgiven. You can't give, come, be a part of anything. You can't build a building. You can't give a scholarship fund. You cannot do anything to get your sins remitted. Jesus did that for you. Now, Luther's argument was that the Bible teaches that the repentance required by Jesus Christ in order for your sins to be forgiven was an inner spiritual repentance rather than simply an external sacramental confession, which means you cannot convince the Lord to forgive you. All right? You cannot make a deal with the Lord. And, and last night in recovery, we talked about that, that many people have the idea that when you start living for God, it's kind of a give and take thing. If I be good, then I can tell the Lord I've been good five days in a row, and you owe me two and a half blessings. We do. I know y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but we do. Because if we fast, we kind of want the Lord to notice we fast. It better be for something. Okay. Okay. And look. So Luther is saying, y'all changed the Bible. This was, and there's a reason why that I'm teaching this this way tonight. This plenary indulgence was an extra biblical doctrine. Y'all know what that means? One, it ain't in the Bible. But it was created to deal with a spiritual dilemma in an earthly, human, or carnal way. In this case, plenary indulgences was dead loved ones who had died unsaved. We needed to come up with a doctrine that would make a way for them to be saved after they tapped out. That came purgatory. All right? And that came indulgences. While the Bible is very clear, in teaching that after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, salvation is now our responsibility. Now, I'm happy to prove that, but Jesus doesn't pay it off. There is not a new sacrifice coming. There's not another Calvary. There's not some more bloodshed. When he came out of the grave on the third day, the plan of salvation was sealed forever for everybody. Amen. Acts 2 and 40. And with many words, many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Which simply means, now that you know what to do, do it. You'll be saved. Okay. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How, how, do you, how can you do anything to affect my salvation if the Bible says i got to work my own out with fear and trembling? But then it goes on to say, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. So there's a collaborative effort. And I'm not going to get into it a whole lot. But my, matter of fact, my reading today in, in Near Christianity was about that. Because there's one line of thinking that says you got to do a whole lot of good stuff to be saved. And there's another line of thinking that says you don't have to do anything to be saved. Just believe. Ain't even one of them right. The truth is, is that a collaborative effort between the Lord Jesus Christ and me. 
My daddy asked me one time, I had a, a large discussion with somebody about eternal security, about the doctrine of eternal security, commonly known as once saved, always saved. And my dad said something very powerful. He said, ask them what happens if you change your mind about being saved. If once saved, always saved, what happens if you decide, I don't want to be saved no more? Makes a lot of sense. Because under that line of thinking, the Lord will say, too bad. You said you believed and now you're saved. Okay. Now, Luther did not intend to start the Reformation that he started. He was calling for an awakening for the people to return to the authority of Scripture rather than any particular church or church leader. I'm going to say that again. Luther was calling for believers to awaken to the authority of Scripture rather than any particular church or church leader. That still remains true today. The Bible is the authority. Yes, what about when we talk about when they were in 1990 and brought out the land for the land? Do what now? What about when we talk about the 1990 and brought out the land for the land? What about that? Yeah, that, you can't be once saved, always saved then either. It all goes back to his vomit and a hog gets cleaned up at the car wash, comes out of a, a hog pen and goes back to it again. Right. You know, so there's, there's scripture after scripture after scripture. But the point is, I'm going to get to the point in just a minute. I'm going to stay with my notes or else I'll go chasing rabbits. But when Luther brought these 95 theses, it was met with great opposition by those who were in power. Same way Jesus was by the scribes, the Pharisees, and Sadducees. Because anytime, I want you to hear this. I respect that any time we believe anything with great conviction, it is difficult to be taken in a different direction. Especially when we view our convictions through the lens of where they came from. For example, if I got that from my parents or my grandparents or a highly respected teacher, mentor, or friend, or greater yet, if what I'm in right now is benefiting me financially, socially, status, and power, I don't want nobody messing with me. You understand what I'm saying right now? That's what Luther was. He, he comes out, he didn't really come out to buck. He came out to bring us back to the word. But everybody who didn't want you brought back to the word decided to buck against him and come against him. They excommunicated him. They He's lucky he lived. Yeah. Now, the main focus of the Reformation was to ultimately return believers to a biblical concept of salvation by faith in Christ Jesus rather than a process that involved good works. Now, a proper evaluation of the scripture shows us that it is faith alone that saves us. Faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, which that work reconciled us to God, restoring the relationship between God and man that was lost when sin came in. Okay? So we believe in the power of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. But however, the book of James, just a little short Bible study, and I've told you before that much of the religious world don't like the book of James. The book of James said, faith without works is dead. How do we know you believe if you don't obey? Well, you just got to take the word for it. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. However, you're glad you came in, Brother Ron, because I was expecting you to grin from ear to ear when I say what I'm about to say. Just as with faith saves us, right? We are saved by faith and not of works. Because if we were saved by works, we would think we were all that in a box of cracker jacks. All right? Obedience to the scripture 
in the likeness of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, it's not our work anyway. It's his work. So look here. Noah, the flood, and how did Noah get saved? Built an ark. Right? Right? No. It's not right. Okay? Believe in God for salvation leads one to obey God and do exactly what his word says. Now here's where we're at, Brother Ronnie. I know I've been here before, but the ark didn't save Noah and his family. Going through the door of the ark saved Noah and his family. He could have built that ark. It could have been the most beautiful yard ornament in the history of the world, no doubt the biggest. But when the rain came, if Noah would have been admiring his building, he would have drowned like everybody else. That's the first time we ever hear of grace in the Bible. Genesis chapter number 6. And it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And what grace was, was not that the Lord just said, bam, you're going to be saved. But the Lord said, I'm going to give you the opportunity to be saved. You still have to obey to be saved. God gave the instructions. And when he and his family went through the door, that's when they were saved. They had to obey him in order to be saved. Now, beginning with Luther, and including some names you might recognize, and we might touch it again, but John Wesley, John Calvin, among others, there was a recurring theme of a desire to return to the original New Testament doctrine and practice. They were wanting to leave behind tradition and go back to scripture. Unfortunately, there was a problem with that. Because Luther, Calvin, Wesley, among others, assumed that when they received the revelation of more, that they had arrived at their destination instead of it being a step taking them back you ready? to Pentecost now Jesus very clearly said the day of Pentecost was the beginning Luke chapter 24 and verse number 47 that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem and when Peter got in trouble over in Acts chapter number 11 for preaching to Cornelius in his household, he testified to the Jewish believers and said, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. So the beginning of the new covenant church was on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Okay. Took tremendous courage. Oh, I, I, got, I, got to, I don't want to skip this. So every bit of revelation, everybody with me? Everybody okay? So when Luther realizes, hey, we're preaching things that aren't in the Bible, we've got to go back to the Bible. But every step, and, and, and the biggest step, of course, was faith rather than works. So Luther takes that step, Brother Terrence, but the trouble is, is he throws his hands up in the air and says, Eureka, I found it. And builds a whole movement right there without even considering that that was just the first step on the road back to the apostles' doctrine. Now, one of the most difficult ideologies, and I, I, I want to be very kind when I say this, but I also have to be true. Does anybody know at the beginning of the Protestant Reformation what the biggest hang-up was? Does anybody know? Here's the biggest hang-up. Is the church did not believe and preached accordingly that people were too ignorant to understand the Bible themselves. That's why, anybody heard of Tyndale? William Tyndale, anybody tell me what happened to him? 
They killed him. They killed him, Brother Robin. You want to know why they killed him? Because he dared translate the Bible into a language that everybody could understand. Because, listen, this is why this is so, so important. If I can keep you from reading the Bible, I can tell you that it says whatever I want it to say, and you believe me. But now, and in another hundred years, Brother David, Gutenberg's going to do the print press, but there, there was, you, you go back and look at history, it, Michael Cervantes, uh, Polycarp, there, there were so many throughout the years that were killed by and large because they wanted this experience and understanding about this experience to be for everybody. Are y'all with me? Yes. That was one of the biggest problems. Yes. So now they begin to step away. A personal relationship with God, personal prayer and study of the Bible was widely discouraged and in many cases outright prohibited. Sometimes they had a law against it. If you were caught reading the Bible, you'd go to jail. It took tremendous courage for Luther to step out in pursuit of more and likewise those that followed his lead. So, I don't know how far I'm going to get tonight. And I knew that coming in. But, but I'm going to take my time. Everybody's all right. Everybody's with me. Yeah. Doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. doctrine. It matters. It matters. Yeah. What is it? Think about, Ronnie, your, your comments last night at recovery. Can I say you was at recovery last night? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Think about your comments at recovery last night with what I'm about to say right now. What is it that would cause anyone to leave behind something that was comfortably familiar in pursuit of of the unknown. They weren't pursuing something they knew. They were pursuing something they didn't know. They were leaving what was the common practice, the common methodology of worship, the common theology, the common biblical interpretation, and going to something they didn't know. What would cause somebody to do that? To sacrifice the safe trappings of religion in pursuit of a bigger, more active purpose or mission. I would argue that what causes somebody to, to leave behind what's familiar is first found in the creation of an appetite which nothing mundane or familiar can satisfy. I believe your words were, I came to the conclusion that I needed something greater than what I had. <coughs> that right, Brother Cole? It's a hunger that keeps, I feel Jesus right now. My Lord have mercy, I feel the Holy Ghost. <coughs> Somebody's connecting with what preacher's saying tonight. Somebody's connecting, look here. It is a hunger that begins to build and build and build until it will not be denied anymore. It's a desire that everybody told me it was wrong, everybody felt that it was wrong, and it even felt wrong to me everywhere and every time until I went to the Word of God and it saved me. But when I, God help me, man, I feel Jesus right now. Brother Blake, when I went to the Word, I found a draw. I found a pulley. I found a something that scratched that itch I had. I went to the Word, and I found a call for more. But everybody around me said, that's stupid. Y'all ready for this? That's a cult. They brainwash you. Huh? Okay. I know, I'm, I know I'm getting a little bit. All they are about is what you can't.
can't do. Now, what would cause you when I read the word, a whole new world opens up to me. One that I cannot deny it, even though I've yet to experience it. I cannot deny that, that it lights a fire inside of me and it does something to me that will not allow me to just sit by silently. I don't think, I want you to hear me, I don't think we clearly understand the price these people paid to pursue more from God. And we need to get a clear understanding of it because we still, we still struggle with the fact that we think somehow we deserve every blessing that God gives us. We deserve to come in here and feel his presence. We deserve to come in here and be healed and to be touched. And the truth of the matter is we know that we never will. We struggle with it a little bit still. Because every time I teach about this, I feel it come back at me. Because some of us think, well, I, I've been pretty good. <clears throat> we were never going to be able to be good enough to be saved. Never. That's why he said to Nicodemus, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, you can't see the kingdom of God and you sure can't enter the kingdom of God. Look here. Here's what's going to happen. When you begin to pursue this truth, this great and glorious biblical doctrine, you're going to be haunted by the promises you read in the Bible that somebody just started preaching because it had never happened in their life. They started preaching as a doctrine them days are over. It's preached in the world right now. Just because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 14, 12, 13, 14, right thereabouts, that whether it be knowledge, it'll cease. Whether it be tongues, it'll cease. Whether it be prophecy, it'll cease. That's not even talking about receiving the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. That's talking about you will not talk in tongues all the time when you get the Holy Ghost. Because if you're talking tongues all the time, you ain't going to help nobody. Everybody's going to think you're crazy. The scripture says they're going to think you're a barbarian. It's not saying that they'll stop. It's saying the Corinthian church, if you read it, they were showing up, talking in tongues the whole service. And said, you weren't helping nobody. That's right, Brother Shannon. He didn't say it's going to stop. He said it ain't going to happen all the time. Now, here's the dilemma they found. Is when they learned to start, when they started learning to understand scripture, Brother Jerry, they're reading promises in that book that somebody told them they couldn't have. But they keep finding in the Bible that the Bible says you can have it. Scriptures like John 14 and 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and No way, Jose. But Jesus said, and greater than these shall you do, because I go. You understand that Jesus Christ had a vision of us making a greater impact than he did himself. Okay. Mark 16. 15 through 18 says, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, why didn't he say baptized the second time? Because you only get baptized if you believe. If you don't believe, you won't be baptized. You don't be baptized, the scripture says. Was that right? It wasn't just my version. Look here. 
And these signs, everybody say these signs, these signs. shall follow. Yeah. Say it. Yeah. Them that believe. Say it. This is very important. It does not say believers will follow signs. It says signs will follow believers. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, that's Jesus' name, they'll cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That's languages they did not previously know. Next verse. They shall take up serpents. Let me tell you something, Brother Derek. Sorry to bust your bubble, Brother. That doesn't mean we're going to handle snakes. It means that as an everyday hazard in their life, snakes were everywhere. And when you went to the wood pile, a good chance you're going to get one, Brother David, just like Paul did on the island. It was an everyday, they lived in a primitive world. They didn't have thresholds on their doors. Okay? And if a snake comes in after one of your kids, grab it and throw it out the door. That was not saying we need to handle snakes. But it was saying in the everyday operation of your life, God is going to protect you. If they drink any deadly thing, that didn't mean everybody was going around drinking bleach. It meant that they did not have plumbing. They got their water from a well, or they got their water from a watering hole. And Brother Billy, it was not an uncommon thing for somebody to throw an old animal into a well of somebody they didn't like. It was not uncommon for water to get alkaline in it, or water to get some kind of, remember when the children of Israel came out, and they got that bitter water, and they had to throw a tree in it? Okay, it was, a, it was a cultural thing to the world they lived in. It doesn't tell us, go around and drink a bunch of strike time. Does that make sense? But the people that believe are going to be shielded and protected from many of the things of everyday life. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We're talking about believers, folks. You think about when you read this, and forgive me, but your pastor has been preaching to you every Sunday. That's in the Bible, and it's a promise, but it ain't really for you. That's what was happening. It's happening still. It's happening still. Okay. Talking about things you read in the Bible that will make you say, I want some of that. I want more than that. I want more. Verse Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So from the word of God. I know it's still really not the way we do it now. What you want to do is you want to get inspired when you come to church and buy a song or something the preacher says. And I want to tell you firsthand, there ain't nothing that will light a fire in you like reading the Bible and figuring out, I think he's talking about me. So, when you start understanding, but think about it, Brother David, up until this time, everybody didn't get to read the Bible. But now we're moving into a time where they can, and all of a sudden, they're reading things in there. That, I feel Jesus, my Lord, I feel the Holy Ghost strong in here. They're reading things in that book that, that are personal. It's kind of like the eunuch. Remember, the eunuch read in there, and he asked the man, who did he talk about? You know what he was hoping he would say, Brother Shannon? talk about you. Because that's the way he was reading. Oh my goodness. I've been preaching this until I just about gave up on preaching it. 
But I come back with a second win tonight to let you know that every promise in the book yeah. is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. I'm trusting in the Lord. That's why God is talking to me. For God so loved the world. And he gave his own to the God so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. So a desire is born. A desire to go to a place that I know I must go. Here we go, Brother Roy. I've got to go there, but I can't get there on my own. Yeah. I can't do it on my own. I need help. And I recognize that the help I need can only come from a power greater than me. Matter of fact, it's a power greater than anyone or anything else. I know. And ladies and gentlemen from the recovery community, may I introduce you to step two. Huh? Which says, I came to believe that a power greater than myself was able to restore me to sanity. But Brother Shannon, we found out something that that word restored is kind of a misnomer because he does not want to restore me to a place I've been before. He wants to restore me to a place he created me for that I have not yet been. But there was a purpose because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. And so the only begotten of the Father full of and truth. Yeah. Logos, the word. Yeah. You know what it means? He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I have, we just came out of that series, I have a created purpose. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Jesus came yeah. a long, long way from heaven yeah. to make a way, Brother Chris, so I can see my purpose for him. That's what lit a fire in these people. But I want to tell you, when you start moving toward Pentecost, I know I'm saying it like that, but it's in the book. It ain't just because we call ourselves Pentecostals, but we call ourselves Pentecostals because we preach the message of Pentecost. All right, all right. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all, let I say all, all, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit uh, gave the utterance. That's Pentecost. Pentecost. The only reason 1031 Mill Street is Pentecost is because we preach, teach, believe, and live that the Pentecostal experience is for you today. Amen. Old song in my spirit right now. Been there all evening. Says, I never shall forget the day. When all the burdens of my soul would roll away, he made me happy, glad, and free. I'll sing and shout it, because he's everything to me. I need help. You can't be good enough. You can't read the Bible enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give in the offering enough. You cannot get to where you're going by yourself. anybody gets you. you call your higher power whatever you want to. I'm telling you, your higher power is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Is this okay? Everybody all right? Yeah. I feel an anointing in this 
this house. I feel a powerful anointing in this place. God's wanting to do some things in your lives, in our lives. He wants to light a fire in us. So 2 Timothy chapter, we're probably going to go here and then we're going to quit for the night. Because I'm going to do the right thing of God, but I want to have enough time to spend on it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 11. There's a little bit of review, but there's some new stuff, so I want to share it with you. Paul is preparing Timothy to be a pastor. In effect, Paul knows he ain't long for this. Matter of fact, Brother Chris, Paul knows the way he preaches and the way he lives and the way everybody's after him. Brother Larry, any day can be his last day. So, he is in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. What did I tell you those were called? Anybody remember? The pastoral epistles, which are letters from Paul to young men teaching them how to be pastors and how to lead people and how to minister to people. And he says, these things command and teach. The reason is, anybody remember seeing a billboard? It went around for several years, but they kind of went away right now. But one of them said, that love thy neighbor stuff, I meant it. Anybody remember seeing that? Yeah. Them commandments wasn't suggestions. The thing we got to get in our down in our gizzard is the commandments of God are exactly that. They're commandments. And we don't have the privilege of picking and choosing which ones to do. Right. Truth is, if you're trying to find a way around the commandments, then that is evidence that you don't love God. Right. Because he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, so Paul is telling Timothy, these things command and teach. Now, if you look it up in commentaries, it will say, some of them will say command and teach is talking about the verses above 11, and some will say it's talking about the verses after 11. I choose to believe that it is a holy interjection that says all this stuff, command it and then teach it. The commandment is, you got to do it. Teaching is... This is why. Okay? He said, let no man despise thy youth, because everybody knows young people are all dumb and can't do nothing for God. That was tongue-in-cheek. It's, it's a still a problem today. You think people got to be a certain age or have a certain maturity level before they got any sense. And I agree on a lot of levels. But I don't want to agree on too many levels because I ain't old enough yet to agree on too many levels. <laughs> but he said, don't let them be afraid or concerned or disregard you because you're young. He said, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. He said, till I come, I'm going to break this down in just a second. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. That chapter's got some new stuff in it I didn't give you last time. Then he says, neglect not the gift that's within you, which was given me by prophecy. So some preacher prophesied over Timothy. And then the leadership laid hands on him and prayed for him, validating that prophecy. And the way he's lived his life proves that it was true. Now look here. He says in verse 15, meditate on these things. Give yourself wholly to them. I'm going to mess with you a little bit on that one for just a minute. That thy profiting, what did I tell you profiting meant? Do anybody remember? That you're growing. What is profit? It's when you take what you've been given 
and make more with it. That your growth may appear to all. Then he says, and this is the scripture I want to point your attention to, and like I said, we're going to go to the house. Don't get too excited because it might take you a hot minute to get through what I'm about to get through. This anyway, he says, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. How long? How long do you think he's meaning? Continue. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear you. The, the contents of the message matters. The way you live your life matters. Look here. He said, take heed unto yourself. So I started looking back, and here's what I came up with in the, out of these verses. Look here. Be an example of the believer in the way you speak. That's uh, in word. Be an example of the believers in the way you speak. Now, I know there's a cool t-shirt running around. I've even seen it shared on Facebook that says, I love Jesus, but I cuss the word. Don't believe that. Don't believe that. You fall in love with Jesus? You may have had a habit as a bad cusser, and there may be one slip out every now and again, but you're eventually going to stop cursing. Oh, you're going to. There, I, I, Logan, you, don't say nothing else, man. They're going to want to give you a check for <laughs> preaching tonight. You're saying too much good stuff. No. That's right. He said, go read James 3 until you don't want to cuss no more. I didn't even have that in my notes, but I should. Because he said, be an example of the believers. In how you speak. So that tells me, Sister Miss Jane, believers speak differently than non believers. Everybody all right with that? Yep, you're going to have to quit lying. You're going to have to quit gossiping. You're going to have to quit cursing. You're going to have to quit sissy cursing. You're going to have to stop texting things that are cuss words and you people ain't got no business sharing a bunch of acronyms through texting and on Facebook because they're nasty. Some of y'all be doing it. Don't try to get all holy on me. I've seen it. And when I didn't see it, somebody screenshot it and sent it to me. <laughs> means the same thing. If you post it or if you text it, you just well be saying it. <coughs> I feel like I could hit something right there. Huh? Said, be an example of the believer. Take heed unto yourself. That means make the changes necessary to be an example of the believer. I hope y'all don't think I'm intimidated because I got too much in, I'll be scared when I go home. And think I done made everybody mad and gonna run everybody off. But right now, I ain't scared. Zero. I got a word from the Lord, Sister Becky. You believe that? Say yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> he said, be an example of the believer in word. That's the way you speak. Oh, man. We got to get it. I want to move on to the next one because it's good, too. They're all good. But we got to get it, folks. Your tongue is the most messed up part of you. That's over in James there, brother. 
Brother Logan. And that's why the Lord chose speaking in tongues as the evidence you received the Holy Ghost because that is evidence that you surrendered your whole body to him. Because the scripture says, like a great big old Titanic boat, you steer, you steer it with a little old rudder. That's your tongue. Is that what the Bible says? And if you surrender your tongue, that's the evidence, because that's the most messed up part of you, and that's the most part we don't want is to surrender. All right. Just because I moved on don't mean I gave in. Look here. He said, then you're going to be an example of the believer when it says conversation. That means the manner of life you live. So you're going to speak differently like a believer. And this is powerful stuff. There's a way believer speaks. And a way believer don't speak. And undoubtedly, it must be obvious to everybody. Huh? Must be obvious. Ain't that right, Sister Miss Jane? Now let me tell you something. I'm not going to tell you that. I'll save it for another time. Be an example of a believer in the way you speak, in the way you live. Charity, that means in the love of God. That doesn't mean that you just give something to the United Way. It means you love people the way God loves them. That's how an example, that's how a believer. Is this, is this making sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something. You know what's happening in the spirit right now? Now, Lacey's not here, is she? Good. She told me when she was a little girl, when something happened that she didn't like what they were saying, she'd hold her breath till she passed out. That's what's happening in the room right now. Is there some spiritual holding of the breath, which means... He done started meddling in my life, and I don't think that's in the Bible, even though he's reading it right out of the Bible. I feel it, Brother Blake. Let me tell you what more. It's part of me. I can get everything right and feel like I'm doing good. Open my mouth and destroy it all. Look here. Spirit. It's a little S P I R I T. You know what it means? An attitude. So be an example of a believer in attitude. Where are you at? You having an alright, bro? Okay. In faith. That includes everything. That's not just believing. That includes being faithful. In word and deed. Then it says, in purity. Y'all don't want me to go here too much. No, oh, none of y'all want me to go here, and I'm not going to go here too much. But it literally means to be chaste. C H A S T E. <coughs> Which is a word. Stop being nasty. Sexual. Believers behave sexually. And present themselves in a way that does not promote sexuality. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody said one amen in the whole house. That's what it is. Who said everybody's nervous? You're nervous. <laughs> <You're> nervous. <laughs> but she knows me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I, I've said this many times. I'm going to say it again. Believers don't try to be sexy on social media. It's to 
truth. Let me tell you something. Everybody, everybody that looks at you trying to be sexy on social media, they just fun. Do what, Brother Kevin? Okay, there you go. There you go. Let me tell you something. You spend 30 minutes fluffing out your hair, pinching your cheeks, checking your nose for boogers, making sure your eyeglasses are set in the right place, and take 50 of them until you get one that looks the best you got. And then put it on there like that's who you are all the time. you spend your time reading and I looked it up and you know what it means it means public reading where the Bible is read to the multitude does anybody know where that happened at Ooh, you know what he's telling Timothy go to church because oh, this you can't make this stuff up this is this is incredible he says Spend your time reading the word in the church house out loud for everybody to get to exhortation. You know what that means? Not yet. That's the next word. Exhortation. You know what that's about? That's when you preach the word and you touch people in their feelings. In their emotions. You fill them up and you make them believe they can do what you've been preaching. And then doctrine. You know what that is? Instruction or teaching. And it ministers to the intellect. And let me tell you something, honey. That's what keeps you when your feelings are messed up. They're going to be messed up. Ain't that right, Brother Cole? And you can convince yourself you're lost. The devil will try to convince. Forget the devil. You'll convince yourself you never had the Holy Ghost. You'll convince yourself that maybe your baptism wasn't no good. You'll convince yourself that you did too much bad. And the Lord, and that when you. And then you go to the Word, and the Word says, repent. And you say, I did that. And the Word says, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you can say, did that? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. I did that. That means I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Holy Ghost has passed away. Behold, all things have come through. And I just took you on the journey. That says, this is this is a joke. I've got a feeling everything's gonna be alright. Because all of a sudden, just a little bit of the word changed my old line and feelings around, and everything I was ready to give up on, now I'm ready to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. Read the word, it'll touch you in your feelings, yeah. and then you get it in your mind. All right. All right. All three of them speak to faithful attendance in church. Be there or be square. Being faithful to the house of God is something believers do. you 
jive that with, I don't know, just a minute. I, I won't forget you. Don't put your hand down because I might. But how do you connect that with, I don't believe you got to go to church to be saved? I ask everybody that asks me that, why don't you want to go to church? What's wrong with you that you don't want to go to church? How is it that you want to try to be saved and not go to church? All right, Kev, light me up, brother. I would just say, uh, you know, I, I believe you can go to certain churches, but when you're church, when you're married and you're church, and you're church and family church, uh, you know, you go pretty church places, but uh, I'm going to do the No, you're wrong. You need to repent every day, not just when you come to church. All right? But, yes, indeed. So, I'm going to see you come to church all the time, and I'm going to raise you, respond to the word all the time. Okay? All right? Because if you're hearing the word... And the word is touching you in your heart. And I know it does. It does. Listen to me. Preachers and service leaders, they all come to me with this one complaint. They only think they're doing a good job if you all respond. That's a lie. That's a lie. Our response is up to us. It is nobody's responsibility to make us respond. I respond according to my faith. And David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because you got to show up with the right attitude in order to get what you need. Because if you don't, the Lord is not going to come around and surprise you with a blessing. He responds to faith. So it is inherent in Paul's admonition to Timothy. He said, this is what you do. Hear the word, let the word touch you, and let the word get in you. I would like to say that's going to happen for everybody. But it ain't. Because we get bitter, and we get angry, and sometimes we're tired, and sometimes all the time we be getting distracted. Not always by what's happening in here, but sometimes what's about to happen out there. And to Brother Ronnie's point, I'm telling you, we need to work on responding to the word. Because it's the foolishness of preaching that's going to save you. Yes, sir. Oh, it's a God's honest truth. Your mama said it. Look here, let me get let me get on with this one part. Spend your time reading exhortation and doctrine. These all speak of faithful attendance to church. Then he said, Don't neglect the gift that is in you. It's a problem in our assembly. A lot of us are neglecting the gift God gave us. Some of us out of ignorance, which means we don't really know what that gift is. But I do know. That believers read the word, exhort, and teach. Okay. I ain't had so much fun. I can't tell you the last time. Then he 
he says, I'm going to mess with you for just a second. He said, I want you to think about these things. So it ain't just when you're at church. I want you to meditate about them. I want you to think about them. And then I want you to do this. Give yourself completely to him. Let me tell you something, gals. Stop making your husband feel guilty for working for the Lord. Stop pretending like your marriage is competition with what God's doing. And get on board with the ministry that God gave you. Your spouse should be your greatest supporter in the work of the king. You can't give yourself completely to the work of the Lord and completely elsewhere. And I'm telling you right now, Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. I love my wife and I'm a good husband. I'll put my marriage up against anybody's, but she don't want to be married to me if I'm not preaching the gospel. In light of that, there is a book of the Bible that comes after Revelation. It's written by the great Jerry Cloud. <laughs> and you need to go read it where he talks about mama don't want nobody messing with the deal she's got going. <laughs> this weekend, Sister Amanda and I will be gone. We're leaving tomorrow. I won't be recovering tomorrow night either. I've got a, I ain't backsliding either. Let me tell you something. You should. I wish I had a picture of what Brother Shannon just did right there. It's what I want to do every time somebody tells me they ain't something. <laughs> Going to Kingsport to uh, uh, do some teaching Friday, about three hours of it. And, uh, and then, uh, so Brother Tripp. He's going to be preaching on Sunday, and uh, he uh, is ready to go. Please don't play with me because I'm not here. I brag on you far and wide because y'all won't be doing that. A lot, of, a lot of my friends, they have to sneak off. True. Because if their people find out they're not there, they won't come either. Y'all don't do that. Don't start. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll be back Sunday evening, and uh, then Wednesday, we're going to do part, well, probably just part two and a half, the second half of part two of this, but uh, praise you, Lord, I love you, I honor you, I praise you, I glorify your name. I thank you for the word, and I thank you, God, for truth, and I thank you for the difference you're making in many of our lives. I thank you, God, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. I thank you for the hope that we have in you the nature of the soul. Keep everybody safe. Pray for the sick. Pray for the afflicted. Let us bring us back safe. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.